Welcome, everyone, to another edition of This is Revolution Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Miles. I'm once again in a different location. Hopefully, this won't be a permanent situation. But today, I'm broadcasting live from the John F. Kennedy Public Library in Vallejo, California. I didn't know that there's little rooms that you can get in the library and it costs you nothing. Tax dollars working for you. Now, before I even introduce my co-host, my homie, my dog, our guest for today is not able to make it. He said he got very ill. Whenever I hear people say that, my first thought is, oh shit, hope he didn't get COVID. So let's send some positive energy out to Jacobin co-editor and I believe he's writing a book on Eugene Debs, Sean Goode. That being said, we found some very suitable villains. Before we even get to those guys, let's bring in the man, the myth, the legend, Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. Someone says I'm dressed like a cool substitute teacher. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hot. It's like 20 degrees hotter in the city that I'm in. So I had to find something somewhat cool. You know, I'm going to bring, before we play the clip, I'm going to bring everyone in. Because I want people to know about the superstar guests that we got. They're not really guests. They're kind of like parts of the show as well. Would you agree with that, Pascal? These guys are like parts of the show as well. Meh. Yes, they are. Oh, yes, a... they are. They are. They are. Tough crowd, please. <laughs> Coming all the way live from Mormon country. Formerly host of Theorizing with the Hammer and Pop the Left. Now he is just the man. I shouldn't say just the man. He is the man at Varn Vlog. The shit starter. I'm not going to let you forget that, D. Derek Varn. I have no idea how this topic is going to connect to the dreaded AP word. So, <laughs> so I have a list of things you guys can read, but it's a few things to know. Um, and one is you'll never guess what Koopa's insignia stands for. And Varn started the Afro pessimist debate. <laughs> and I said, I have amazing friends that I love dearly. So I want you guys to know that another friend that I love dearly he is broadcasting live from a bunker somewhere in the great Northwest. He is the representative of the deep state. Deep state, Cuba. Hello, everyone. The um, Sorry I haven't been um, more active recently, but there was a Canadian election and I needed to fix it before I could <laughs> zoom. Uh, <laughs> The, is there also is there any way that we can retcon um, Varn's backstory so he's Indonesian because I'd really <laughs> like to call him the shit starter from Jakarta. <laughs> the shit starter from Jakarta. Jakarta. <laughs> Sounds like a wrestler. <laughs> yeah. After the thriller from Manila, it's uh, Southeast Asia's greatest export. <laughs> the shit start <laughs> from Jakarta. People are all excited about the topic. I'm seeing one. I'm seeing Red Wizard. It's time to mama Eugene Debs. Let's go. <laughs> so we made we made a video for this. So I have to make a lot of these clips now, kind of ahead of time to get life stone to curveball. I'm trying to stay back in the batter's box. And sometimes, like Pascal has these ideas sometimes, and he just starts just 
farting out ideas left and right about shows he wants to do. And sometimes Mean Gene Bajlan goes, oh, I got somebody for your ass. You want to do that Deb show? So Pascal's like, I want to talk about Eugene Debs, motherfucker, cracker, da, 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 you know how he talks. And so you, uh, Gene puts the show together, and then I was like, Pascal, come on, you know, I need, I need to get the the blurb for this show. What we're we gonna say? Because I know there's a certain way you want to you want to handle this Debs thing. You don't just want a history. You don't just want to talk about his activism in the labor movement. You want to really get at this guy. So Pascal writes the fucking. Right, some blurbs and me. I put the video together. As I put the video together, I'm trying to find any video footage of Debs being mean to black people, and I couldn't find any. Pascal. I didn't say you were going to find video footage. But what I did find was a whole lot of Bernie Sanders speaking for Eugene Debs. Oh, here we go. He really loves Eugene Debs. Uh. He recorded an album of Debs like speeches in the 70s. I didn't take any of that for this clip. But I did get a person that actually knew Eugene Debs. So let us watch this extremely short clip and then uh, Pascal and I will be angry and then Cuba and Varn will stick up for Debs. That's not what's going to happen. <laughs> no? Okay, fine. Ruin everyone's fun. history of the United States, only half a dozen people stand out as great leaders, great humanitarians. And I think Deb should be so recognized as one of the great, humane, lovable people that's come into the world. Heralded as one of the greatest socialist leaders of the 20th century, Eugene Debs is often remembered as a champion of labor rights and the working class. However, Many voices have questioned Deb's dedication to the struggle of black workers. In this episode, we will discuss the legacy of Eugene Debs. This is Revolution. As a wage worker, I came to realize the oppressions and suffering of the working class and to understand something of the labor question. like the outer space part at the end pascal it was rather cool okay i do all this shit for you to go hey brother i've never questioned your intro video making abilities you always impress me and you get better and better with time correct take it i will take it so eugene debs for those that don't know barn you want to give us a quick uh, backstory on debs <laughs> Uh, Debs was born in 1855. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I mean, he was a major socialist politician, um, ran for president uh, four times and um, went to prison, I believe, twice. Uh, definitely the biggest, uh, the most important one was um, opposing when he went to prison and ran a campaign from prison opposing uh, Wilson. Um, he was a democratic politician in the late 1870s, 1880s, and um, be began uh, working in the railroad uh, federation, started calling for uh, industrial unionization uh, around the turn of the century. Um, also became a socialist politician, broke with gompers um, uh, in 1902 uh, and started thinking the AFL-CIO was not going to be as useful as the original, I mean, the, excuse me, AFL-CIO, AFL um, was not <laughs> going to be as use, useful as he, as he thought. Um, he founded the IWW or co-founded it 
uh, he co-founded the 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 Socialist Party of America, um, which was the largest uh, socialist organization um, in U.S. history. Probably, um, it, it's hard to know actually at its high point which was bigger, the SPA or the CPUSA in the '30s. It's it the numbers aren't entirely clear. Um, so, I mean, that's that's the shortcut about him. I, he's he is positions. He's one of the few people who radicalizes increasingly with age. Um, he opposed striking in the 1870s. I mean, that's something that's are often forgotten about him. Um, well, he was a capitalist, from my understanding, until because he felt that uh, this great expansion of industrialism. Yeah, he was a he was a Whiggish capitalist liberal Democrat. Um, and we have to remember that the Democratic Party of 1880 is like, you know, 20 years out from being the party of the Civil War, um, uh, the party of the Civil War reactionaries. Um, mm -hmm. The Dixiecrats. So, yep, the Dixiecrats and and all that. Um, he's He starts off, he, he believed in a labor compact very early on too, um, but he abandons all that. Um, through the strike waves of the 1890s. That's when all that really starts to change. Um, and so during that time period, he starts not only supporting striking, but thinking that like the, 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 the Knights of Labor and then the AFL weren't doing enough. Um, and he becomes increasingly radical. Uh, there are, however, you know, his position on race is is not is uh, not easily discernible from time period to time period. He starts off basically as a, as a liberal Democrat in the party of the Confederacy. Um, and that's pretty much undeniable. He, he initially supports um, segregation on trains. He initially, stand, he initially supports the Knights of Labor's position on, um, on, uh, black and immigrant labor um but by 1902 he he opposes gompers as keeping the um unions racially segregated by 1905 he um he begins to really really push um against victor Berger, who is an outright xenophobe um in fact when um uh, the, the, when the early social Democrats and then the, uh, um, and then the Bolsheviks like list their criterion of socialists who should be excluded from the international, um, jingoistic socialists are included and they specifically have Victor Berger in mind. Um, so it's, he's a complicated figure in that his positions change and become, more and more radical. And unfortunately, in a lot of the socialist, hag socialist hagiography about him now, they don't talk about his early development very much. It's something that it is seen as kind of embarrassing. Um, that's a very, very quick capsule <laughs> run through of, of the man. He's obviously quite complicated. Um, well, you're, you know, every, everything, everything I've read about Debs and I definitely you know, watched my share of videos too the other day, uh, getting ready for the show. Why do you think, let me, this question goes out to the panel, not just far. Why do you think, um, that when we look back on Eugene Debs, we definitely don't really look back on his early years. Why is that omitted from the canon? I'd like to pick this up. I think that because Debs is basically considered a martyr, to American socialism and particularly to the democratic socialist version of socialism that has become prevalent in America today. And frankly, there are a faction of people who are socialists or leftists or sock Dems who cling to the purported militancy of Debs as a way of shoring up their board of fides in the face of the fact that the Communist Party, the CPUSA, was always more radical on the on the labor question, was always more radical 
on the black question and was always, quite frankly, more brutally surveilled by the state than the socialists. And frankly, the socialists like to cling to Debs because of, you know, his imprisonment and his kind of martyrdom and all that stuff. That's kind of like, look at our guy. He's radical too, because he gives this posture of, uh, of uh, militancy in the face of the fact that for the large part of the early 20th century, the American socialists, definitely the Socialist Workers Party and the other socialists were racist as hell. And they didn't give a damn about black people. And frankly, one of the main reasons why people like Cyril Briggs and a lot of the early blacks would not join the Socialist Workers Party or the Socialist Party, even though Hubert Harrison was a socialist and A. Philip Randolph, people like Cheryl Briggs, the African Black Brotherhoods, the reason why they became the early members of the CPO USA and the Communist Party after the Bolsheviks is because the communists made a direct hardline stance that not only was the black liberation a part of challenging capitalism and labor unity, it was the front line agenda of the common turn internationally. Well, until 1936. Well, until until, until 36, because of the popular front. Right, exactly. (laughs) I think that um, Pascal is is absolutely right. And I I would just um, also suggest that there's, feeling that Eugene Debs is unproblematically American. The, uh, mm-hmm. He appears in, he gets a positive profile in the American trilogy of John Dos Passos. You know, you encounter him in history books. He's, uh, the Wobblies are kind of this indigenous working class socialist movement in the United States. While the Communist Party, for a lot of people who, well, throughout the Cold War, it was just toxic for uh, Americans, even even sympathetic to um, the left because it was adversarial. And the uh, communism seems foreign to America, even in pre-Soviet, you know, Karl Marx, German uh, variations. While well, Eugene, Je- Eugene Debs gives um, socialism an American founding father. That's uh, well, easy for people clear. to embrace. The early communists in the United States tended to be not only European immigrants, but also black immigrants. There were a lot of uh, uh, afro Caribbean as well, you mm. know, uh, that, 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 that gravitated to communism early on. But let's not forget that very quickly that communism spread in the South amongst African-Americans. It, didn't, it was not simply a Northeastern phenomenon. And let's also not forget that we had two factions of the count. We had the CPUSU, the uh, CPSUSA, and I believe the communist. What was the other other faction that was more American and less European immigrant based? So they they developed a very strong American non immigrant uh, uh, support for the Communist Party as well. But I will agree with Cuba that in the in, in the beginning. The the, uh, the the communist movement was largely European immigrants, uh, black immigrants, some black Americans, but that changed relatively rapidly, particularly when the CPUSA, U, CPUSA developed its black belt thesis that argued for black self-determination and autonomy in the South. And so, anti-lynching. I mean, we have and, to keep and, that in mind. The, and and let's not forget, thank you, Jason, the 800-pound gorilla in the room that basically told many of the black leftists that the socialist party wasn't about shit was that they would not fight lynching. Right. I mean, and, and what happens in the 1920s, I mean, why the SP, why the SPA collapses from a, a group that can, that contends between nine and 20% of the vote, depending on who you listen to, which no socialist movement after that is done. Um, is that the left of the of the SPA immediately went into three different parties, one of which was the CPUSA. I mean, so the people the the people who were around Debs, who were his support in the left of the SP uh, of the SPA, left 
after after 19 between 1917 and 1921 and a lot of that has to do with not knowing how to deal with communism and not them not really Debs despite his leadership of the party never really won within the party against the the right of the socialist party within the within the socialist party of America he even though he was the head figure the the burger position was the more dominant position within the SPA. Do you guys think that the reason why that was the dominant position is because the majority of black people still at this point in time are agricultural workers in the South? And a lot of this, a lot of this, the bigger players in this movement are in these uh, metropolitan I, let me, cities. Let me tell you why I don't think that's an excuse, because we're talking about less than 20 years after the populist movement. And you have the Colored Farmers Alliance, which is one of the most militant labor movements in the history of black America that is in the South, that is working with the White Farmers Alliance, not necessarily in a romanticized way. So the notion <laughs> that agricultural workers were not able to to mobilize on labor issues challenging southern bourbon capital. I don't find to be a justifiable excuse to basically not take their 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 uh, their uh, issues under concern. We're talking about black folk who were in the South who were literally challenging the Klan, Southern aristocracy, with their lives to challenge capital. One of the greatest movements, probably in the history of this country, that no one in Black America talks about today, largely because they were willing to work with white people. Probably not in a romantic way. There were a lot of problems. There was a lot of racism. But the bottom line is, uh, let's not forget that black elites like w that Booker T. Washington uh, and Anna Julia Cooper were financed and supported by, you know, Southern bourbon capitalists to completely gut the populist era movement and the Colored Farmers Alliance and the Farmers Alliance because they challenged capital. That's exactly. I remember on social media less than three days ago, I saw black people celebrating, oh the the, uh, I don't know, 100 something anniversary of Booker T. Washington's Atlanta Compromise speech. I was like, have you ever read Booker T. Washington's Atlanta Compromise speech? It was racist, it was anti-immigrant, it was xenophobic, and he basically said that black people would agree to be almost kind of like docile tools of American capitalism without challenging them like, and not give them any kind of labor or union problems like these other immigrants. This is a man, by the way, that speech, some people argue, wasn't even totally written by Booker T. Washington, who almost always had a ghostwriter, who was being, being financed largely by American capitalism to completely gut one of the most militant black labor movements in the country. You're the first person to say Booker T. Washington had a ghostwriter. This is known. A lot of people know this. So I... What I find fascinating about the, the issue with Debs is not so much that Debs was a racist, because I think if you compare him to even most of the socialists of the of the same time period, he was relatively progressive. Um, it's that it hides the fact that the SPA didn't do much about this, and and it hides the fact that the the SPA didn't do much about yellow card journalism. And while the Wobblies, which also are, you know, historically connected to Debs, um, did take better stances on that, when it comes to the South, after Mate One, they give up. But, I mean, it's they just don't try anymore. Um, they pretty much feed the entire region. So the only people working that area become the communists. Um, largely through trying to work with um, black agrarian labor, and the communists also do something a little a little differently. I think partly because of the racial issue and the the idea of the black belt nationhood, and I think also partly because um, they don't treat sharecropping um, as peasantry; they treat it as uh, agrarian. Proleta uh, proletarianization, um, which means that their view of agrarian workers is different from people who view sharecroppers as small proletarians like large peasants or whatever, which they kind of were not. They did not really, I mean, they were they were subject to rentiers, they didn't really own the land, and they didn't really even own their own crops. So calling them petit bourgeois or proto-petit bourgeois in any way 
was totally misleading, but it was common. Um, and it was also common actually after the forties. Um, and that's why I had that little snide comment about after 1936, because a lot of this stuff in the CPUSA gets snuffed out too, not just because of the red scare, but because of the popular front and the fact that to form the popular front, they had to side with the Democrats who had not yet even begun to purge their 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 racist base in the south that was the main of the democrats until hell almost into the 1980s in some areas so it's it's something that i think our our history of this is totally distorted and a lot of the a lot of the people talking on this basically want to make the u.s what you know the the uh, the problems of the u.s left totally disappear by focusing on a few heroic figures and only in select periods of their life. Well, I mean, quite frankly, part of the problem we have um, also is that we have people on the left today in America who are afraid of the C word, i.e. communism or communist, and they don't want to be associated with it. And they, they, they were like, oh, okay, people like socialism. Socialism is okay. That's fine. And by the way, I'm not a communist. I am a socialist. But I don't have a problem with admitting that communists did more aggressively to challenge capitalism in the movement in the United States in the early 20th century before the popular front than the socialists did. And they were much more aggressive by far, even after the popular front, than any time. The socialist parties in this country ever were. In it was with the, the American right. Negro Labor Coalition that uh, got started out of the out of the Communist Party. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, if you were if you were a a, a black activist, even in the fifties, if you wanted a living and you couldn't get a a respectable job with like the the NC double uh, um, NNA yeah. double ten, the, the, NCAA. The NA, the NC, yeah, the NC, yeah, <laughs> the NC, <laughs> whatever. I can't. My acronyms are totally blurring together. Today. Um, and you could get that job. You you could get it. You actually could get a decent living from working for the for, for the Communist Party because they would actually pay, um, pay you, and they really didn't discriminate on hiring practices. I mean, that's like a lot of, a lot of like the Black Cultural Renaissance was actually funded by, by the CPUSA. Um, but it's, it is, um, I, I think, I think Pascal's right. There's, we still have the, the, the legacy of the Red Scare, the Red Scare, people being afraid of the, and of the, the Cold war. war. Yeah. Not and, to mention the Cold War. Yeah, totally. Um, we also have, I mean, we also have the fact that on, on the more radical left, if you encountered the CPUSA in the 90s or the aughts, they were basically just, you know, how do I say this nicely? Um, Democrats with Stalin paraphernalia. Well, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, like, because I encountered them in the aughts, and I was just like, "Wait, you're telling me to go vote for Barack Obama?" Oh, okay. I mean, I, I guess, sure. Um, and uh, so there is that immediate history too. But I think the bigger deal, honestly. Is that not only has a has the CPUSA kind of it has the Cold War, it has the Red Scare, it's also kind of been scrubbed in uh, in Black cultural history. Like no one taught me that Lorraine Hansberry and Richard Wright yeah. were both in the CPUSA. Yeah. You know, and that you could watch her documentary. They don't really talk about that. The two-hour documentary on her doesn't really get it too much into that either. Probably one of the, I mean, one of the first things that Jason and I, one of the first conversations we had when we started doing the show together was that we were both motivated in reintroducing Black left history to contemporary Americans, Black or otherwise, because this history had been so lost, not to play show, show me the books I'm reading, but the cry was unity, communists and African Americans, nineteen seventeen to nineteen thirty six, by Mark Solomon. Very good. 
I just hammer, hammer, and, hammer and hole. Say hammer hammer and hole by uh, uh, Robin D. G. Kelly. Very good book as well. Now, you know, I don't want to trigger Cuba too much is here because he's like, you know, we're talking about the communists and, you know, his Stalin nerves is about to explode in front of us and whatnot. But I I mean, I know, I know, I know of our, some of the Marxist Leninist comrades are going to be like, I don't necessarily believe that you necessarily have to be a communist and be a Stalinist. I think you can, we can critique Stalin and we can say, you know, he made his, we had, he had his errors. He made his contributions. We, we can talk about the I, this is my position on all of this. I think that is ridiculous. In 2021, after 50 years of capitalist realism and neoliberalism, but we barely have a fart sniff of a left for us to be arguing about burying Stalin or Sock Dems or Trots or MLs, or anarchists, or love stoneites, or anyone else, again, where most people don't care or know what any of this shit is about. Agreed. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'll i say something because my name was mentioned, and the reality is that uh, the Communist Party is more than the Soviet Union, it's more than the People's Republic of China, Um and especially when you look at the early part of the 20th century, you have movements um, all over the world that are um, agents of some significant social change and positive social change. And to universally, uh, you know, purge the part of the left that is that has the communist label without examining what different groups and individuals of different periods have done is and you know it, that throws away some very valuable legacies um on and not just in the united states but the, the national liberation struggles of things like the um, Viet Minh or um the cuban communists those are those are success stories in a lot of ways and it's this tangled american problem with how to think of communism how to think of communists who seem to do things that even american liberals sometimes like uh, the label becomes too challenging and someone like eugene debs get, allows you to get away from all of that discomfort with uh you know all american i was uh, gonna say is it, is it a wholesome father. thing the Terre Haute, indiana native you know being radicalized uh in actually working on in the railways to want to change the way we look at labor i mean he does have people in the chat are throwing out these factoids about eugene debs but you know, trust me, it's it's really not as simple as, as some factoids of him not wanting to speak in front of segregated audiences at a certain point in his life. You know, Eugene yeah. Debs said and, and did some, there's a reason why we're doing this show and it does revolve around the Negro question. I mean, I think to be fair, right? It would be easy if I, w I wanted to put on my Mau Mau hat and use like, you know, terms like, oh, Eugene Debs was just a typical leftist cracker or crass reductionist, blah, blah, blah. But to be fair to Debs, Debs does evolve on his racial politics and becomes the more militant on black justice and equality than most of his socialists towards the later part of his life in the early 20th century. Let's be very clear. This is a man who was rigorously praised by Hubert Harrison, famous black socialist, a. rigorously Philip praised Randolph. by uh, uh, um, a. a. Philip Randolph, well-known socialist, was very loved and admired by W.B. Du Bois, well-known American socialist, and came a long way in arguing that the American labor movement had to not only include, but had to stand for the rights of black labor and black workers and black 
political equality. But where did he stand on social uh, on segregation? And he, I, he was an but, integrationist by the 20th century. Yeah, I agree with that. I would, that's, that's a good. I, I would agree with that by the 20th century. Yes, he is not in his early political career. I mean, that's like I, I think with Debs, what you see is someone who starts off as kind of a low key bigot, and when I say low key, like comparing him to the rest of the Democratic Party. Um, uh, and ends up kind of progressive on race. I mean, not kind of. He was definitely progressive on race. Um, uh, but in this terms of, of even the socialist movement in the 1920s. And he was also progressive in immigration. But it, it is not overnight and it is not instant. And that can't be ignored. His early positions are the same positions as the Knights of Labor. And they're they're only slightly to the left of the Democrats, and only through actively dealing with with you know trying to organize labor movements in the 1890s that he stopped to drop those positions, like, you know. And so I think like I think he is really a figure who does learn on the ground, but if you focus solely on him, right, like you miss what American U.S. socialism was, and in the early um, 20th century and the, and the late 19th century, like it, it, it was until 1914, it was rail to the right of most of the European socialist parties. 1914 is weird because, because that is the period where the U.S. Socialist Party takes the right position and the German Socialist Party takes the wrong one. Um, uh, and that pretty much gives us most of what happens in World War II, if we're completely honest. But but until that point, you would have thought that, like, the American socialists were just, you know, like, <laughs> that they were willing to have Klansmen in their midst. And some of them were. I mean, that, that cannot be denied, even though that, that in and of itself is what killed the, the ability for the South to unionize. Like, the South never, ever unionized you know like i lament like personally because i'm born in georgia i lament that that the cpusa didn't finish its work in the south after 1936 like i i like that's actually like a big historical sore point for me but they did more than anybody else did go read like um like uh the socialist workers party the the the, the early trotskyist party was well to the right of Trotsky on race. Like that's and and pretty late. That only really stops in the 1960s. Well isn't the Socialist Party line pretty much like these black uh this black agriculture labor is never going to be part of the proletariat revolution. The, the, um, so unfortunately I had all these quotes from Debs highlighted and I forgot it. Essentially, yeah, that basically they were, it was like they were um, retrograde peasant labor and analogous to kulags in Europe at be at, at worst and uh, just backwards labor at best. And they would be like the rear guard of the revolution at best. And, that was the stance. And, um, and, the, and the Russians okay. saw it differently. Does anyone want to get into how the Russians viewed Black well, Stalin program. was a big supporter of the Black Belt thesis proposed by Harry Haywood. Uh, uh, Stalin was also a strong ar ar advocate of, of ad fighting for uh, Black autonomy, political autonomy in the South. Uh, if you read a quote by Robin D.G. Kelly about Hammer and Ho, you know, Stalin is sending, sending uh, correspondence to Black Southerners that he's willing to send in, like, you know, military to the United States if if hey. if the southern you know aristocracy messes with them go for it although go. i i point out that um the there was a soviet um school of international realpolitik that recognized the mobilization of minority groups in opposing states as an effective destabilization tactic and I think that it was most effective for that real political goal when it was also ideologically consonant. So 
uh, for instance, in South Africa or in the United States, where you have a aggressive adversary of um, the Soviet Union and, and international communist movement, uh, that's also ideologically odious through racialized ex capitalist exploitation. That's a, you know, that it's very easy to get comrades behind that. Um, but it wasn't entirely the ideological motivator um, it, or a humanitarian motivator. It was partly the Soviet um, painted into a corner, internationally isolated, lots of enemies, very few friends, uh, play to try to break its encirclement by weakening some of its rivals. Yeah, but it, I mean, why was the Soviet Union being put, painted into a corner? Because it was an anti-capitalist political movement oh, yeah. in the world of capitalist oh, yeah. imperialism, and ideologically oh, yeah. wanted to break capitalism. Oh, so yeah. to say that they were doing real politique in line with the ideology yeah. as a Soviet project is not problematic when their project is to end capitalism. No, I'm, I'm just pointing out that there is, um, there is that uh, international political um, dimension to it, and the Soviets sometimes we're willing to foreclose on uh, groups that they had once supported if there's yes uh, the the african or the american uh negro labor was it coalition or congress was it congress i can't remember what the c stood for well i think but, that we will all agree that the rise of fascism and the popular front puts a serious chink as an understatement in the effectiveness of the Communist Party USA in the United States. I say all the time, I don't give a damn. I think the Popular Front was the biggest mistake the left and the Communist Party have made in the United States. It was a nightmare. The left never recovered from it, and it basically shut leftism down in the U.S. Uh, the, okay, there's um, there's something that we should talk about because uh, a super chat got um got a super out. Chat did. Let, me, let, me, let me bring it back up. Let me bring it back up. You guys, can you hold on for me? Somebody can't finish. Can finish. Somebody threatened to talk to Gene, which is a little like asking to speak to the manager. And now I'm I'm anxious. <laughs> Talking to Gene. That's like <laughs> that's like saying I need your district manager's number. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is going straight to corporate. Gene Bajlan is the district manager of Leftist Podcast. But it's a good question. Um, so did you remember, oh, here, here it is. Here it is. Sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. Mm -hmm. Here it is. Uh, what are folks' preference on free markets versus central planning? I assume there's a preference that socialists and communists might differ in. So let me take a first stab at that. Um, the whole question of markets versus planning only comes up after the Russian Revolution when the um, Bolsheviks have to come up with a political economic model for a post-revolutionary society. The NEP. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, the NEP. And the, the NEP is interesting because it combines planning with um, markets at the local scale, especially for agricultural produce, with um, farmers basically operating like um, small-scale capitalists. Uh, while the commanding heights of the economy, that's Lenin's famous phrase, are uh, subject to a uh, greater degree of uh, central planning. Then with the five-year plan, the market elements of the NEP are abolished. You have collectivization of agriculture and you have full-on central planning across the entire economy. So the uh, post end of NEP, you know, um, in the Stalin period and onwards, communism is intrinsically linked with central planning as the main political economic expression of the um, ideal ideology socialists are more ambivalent about um, whether or not markets need to be replaced by central planning and the utility of central planning um, in achieving either welfareist or developmental goals for um, for specific uh, states that might have a, a socialist or a left-wing government. And that, especially in the European context where you have socialist parties um, in France, Mitterrand is a socialist president, the 
that's a major distinction between sock Dems um, and communists. The willingness for socialists to work with uh, capitalist markets, um, domesticate them, tame them, but allow them to operate on some scale versus communists that abolish those markets entirely and replace them with central planning. I, I would I would add to and complicate that by however by after the 1980s that most of the sock Dems are no longer Marxist even of the market variety. Hmm. Um, they're they're yeah. they're Keynesians and post Keynesians, and that the communists are also embracing markets again, such as in such as in uh, China, China, Vietnam, China, uh, and the liberalization of Vietnam. Correct. Um, I would uh, my answer to I mean my personal answer to this is. Uh, <laughs> is uh, I think I think Soviet cybernetic theory gets us out of a lot of these contradictions. And before Soviet cybernetic theory, I think the NEP, as run by Bukharin specifically, is probably the best way to go. After Soviet cybernetic theory, I wish they hadn't abandoned it to the capitalist, um, because we don't really know what it could have been used for. I mean, uh, you you have IND kind of playing with a little bit with CyberSim, but it was not that that was only a small element of what the soviets were trying to do in the 50s and it, it's a good soviet technology that gets given to the capitalists and the capitalists get to develop the internet unfortunately and a lot of other social technologies based off of it um and when i say cybernetic i do not mean computers fix all your problems i mean studying the way feedback loops work in human in human systems which is what the internet is based off of not just the computer part of it or the interface um so my answer is, is is that the question is somewhat irrelevant now um, because one, uh, also in, in, in no capitalist country at this point do you not have central planning. Um, uh, so that's also kind of a misnomer. Well, um, there's a difference between central planning and privatized central planning. planning. In that, yes. Yeah. The um, And in one of the one of my big motivators to study political science was to figure out how development ever happens. And in the case of the East Asian miracle and post-war European um, reconstruction, you have planning agencies basically left over from World War II that provide a blueprint and with mandates, incentives, um, and goals that private producers then work towards a kind of hybrid you know, this, this starts with state planning after military expansion that basically incentivizes private sector to follow after with massive government subsidies by the way to follow through on technology and non-competition agreements too which yeah, non -competition -competition agreement. yeah cartelization so i think um, the, i think the whole debate is a charade because mm -hmm. I, my argument is that capitalism doesn't happen without the state in the 20th century or ever quite frankly yeah no, yeah I, I, I yeah no that. that's that's correct the the idea that there's a free market version of um capitalism where you just let people do whatever and you end up with nevada or new hampshire is is entirely fanciful it's an ideological delusion of the libertarian right and a, a state is essential to not just establishing the institutions of a free market but also pushing developmental projects through usually by the defense budget and um using public money to push Technolo technology into uh, you know everyday use. I, I would uh, I would the the only thing I would add to this is that in classical Marxism and classical Orthodox Marxism, as stated in in the critique of the Goethe program, it, um, it is clearly stated that Marx thinks in the transition between. Uh, between capitalism, socialism, and communism. And that's a weird distinction that he only makes in that text. Uh, it's not made anywhere else. Um, he admits that, that bourgeois elements will still exist in the early stages of the transition. And that has been what those bourgeois elements are, are not defined. 
So we don't know if it's, um, you know, if he means markets, if he means parts of the state apparatus, because the nation, the nation state, as we understand it, is, you know, is Marx is a capitalist innovation as opposed to the feudal kingdoms, etc. cetera. Um, uh, we don't, it's not clearly defined because it's a text that unfortunately, even though it's the one where Marx makes it the most clear, is also one that he suppressed himself for socialist unity reasons um, during his lifetime and was only published after his death. Um, so it's, it, you know, I, I would say that it's a non-question that neither, that neither socialism, that socialism, uh, that socialism might have something like markets, even even non-market socialism. Like when you look at stuff like uh, uh, councilist planning regimes and council communism and um, cyber sin, all of them have market like market like information barriers. As did actually the five year plan, um, and uh, we have to kind of admit that. And I say this deliberately and, and, and somewhat inflammatorily to kind of piss off everyone. Stalin taking Trotsky's advice about collectivizing agriculture super quickly was a world historical disaster. Um, and me saying it la that way is deliberate. Like, because the big advocate for that um, before Stalin does it is Trotsky and, and his fights with Lenin and Bukharin. So it's, you know, and I always find it ironic when, you know, like Trotskyists will bring up the famines as a critique of, of um, Stalinism. I'm like, well, there's many things that you can legitimately critique Stalinism on that Trotsky is not responsible for. And he may not be responsible for this either, but this was also his policy. Well, the, and, and I think that this actually shows some common ground with the turn away from organizing uh, African agricultural labor in the United States. There is a bias in uh, Marxism that derives from the elevation of the proletariat, the industrial proletariat above um, the peasantry. And then this confusion about where do we draw the line between the traditional feudal peasantry and different forms of capitalist exploitation in the countryside. Well, you know, who come, you know who comes along to remedy all those problems, my friend. <laughs> We've Is got some Maoists in the room. Maoists <laughs> in the room. Maoists in the room. Here come all the Maoists in the room. Maoists in the room. Maoists in the room. The, although that's a really interesting point, because I think that you might be able to make an argument that... Um, traditional Chinese agriculture had been marketized before much earlier than um, than agricultural production elsewhere, like the landlordism and s squeezing peasant labor was a fact of life that they had complained about in, you know, since the Ming dynasty, since the Han dynasty. Right. It, it was very the, old uh, in China. Exactly. So I think that this is a way in which communism with Chinese characteristics actually um, fills in some omissions from the, you know, the straight version of, uh, of communism and uh, picks up some developments that had been missed, um, especially in terms of the revolutionary potential of the agricultural population and what, um, and the shift in different modes of exploitation in the countryside where so many Western Marxists just have feudalism on the brain and can't <laughs> can't see beyond it. <laughs> well, well, I mean, I do think this is a legit problem with um, man, well, people. Part are of the like, problem with that also is let's not forget that the Soviet project is dealing with a feudal peasant agricultural economy that mm -hmm. industrializes basically under Stalin. So this right. whole problem mm -hmm. that Marxists have is like, well, we need to have an industrial society for us to truly be able to have Marxism. And mm -hmm. Marx really said that socialism can only develop in the West. It's kind of bullshit because the Soviet Union 
was a fucking feudalist peasant society based on agriculture. And yes, we do know that Marx said that the last place he expected socialism to be able to take off was in the Soviet Union. Yeah, although he also oh. thought that if socialism could develop without going through capitalism, it actually would be in Russia. I mean, so you have yeah. that. But, you have that but weird it's the, contradiction. It's the Incan Empire problem, right? Like, you can get industrialized socialism in Russia but you'll be doing it yourself, which means that the blood of all of those peasants, all of those workers is on you. Well, and we're acting as if the Industrial Revolution in the West, even though it took place over maybe 30, 40, 50 years, didn't have buku, buku, buku oh, of course, peasant of labor. Course, but, that's, but that's where the uh, leftists, especially the Marxists, could get on their moral high horse, right? You capitalists did all of this. We just want to distribute the the gains more equitably. We are humanitarians. You guys are monsters. And then, you know, the Incan Empire and the Soviet Union. Well, and... uh, yeah, I, I think part of the, if you we want to get into R Russian, like, we, the, I blame Plenkanov, uh probably because he's the person who abandons Marxist uh, uh, theory about the the uh the the peasants councils being able to piggyback on capitalist development in europe and just skip over it um by by um being able to adopt european technologies probably maybe even before socialism fully develops in europe he does he does write that in the letter to uh to Verzula. um but it's ignored and partly because the it wasn't well known it was not a public letter um, so the Russian uh, Marxists didn't know about it for the most part. And when they did, they thought it was already too late to happen that the peasants councils had already been too deracinated by the attempt at bourgeois development under the czar. So like we, we have a whole history there. I think the Chinese case is more interesting in a lot of ways because Mao was more was in some ways more attuned to the fact um, that a, there was no way that there was going to be a revolution in China uh, without peasant labor, and B, that the conditions of of historical development in China did not follow the model prescribed in Marx. Although when he comes up with that, to be honest, he hadn't read Marx yet. It was just sort of an intuition that he had. Um, I mean, we the other thing you must remember is like. Uh, in China, Kropotkin gets translated, and that's the first thing that I think Mao reads. Then, then Stalin and uh, and Lenin and Marx kind of drifts in later, um, and was translated kind of in the twenties concurrently to the like the things actually beginning on the ground. And from everything I've read about Mao's um, intellectual biography, he reads Marx last, and um, because of that, he doesn't have the S. P. Day's interpretive framework of Marx um, because he's not really getting it. He does have Stalin and Lenin's um, for good and for bad, but he develops this on his own. And and similarly, actually, to bring this back to Debs, I mean, part of the thing about Debs when we want to like deal with what he thought about Marx or about, because he was, he, he did read Marx, but what, what Marx that was available in America was like the manifesto. Um, you know, like not all, and like articles that he had written in German in New York for a New York newspaper, but you had to read German to know them. Um, and so like the American socialist movement is also kind of developing on its own. There are, there are English, there are British translations of Marx that filter in. Um, but in the, in the 19th century, there's not a lot to work off of either. Um, in either place, and probably, I mean, less than you'd even have in Russia. In Russia, that stuff was highly suppressed. So, um, yeah, I actually have tried to figure out when what Marx was available in the U.S., but a lot of it's the early 20th century. So, I mean, no. what, yeah. We are at an hour, and <laughs> they're telling me at the library. No, they're not telling me yet, but they did tell me that. Hey, man, we're going to kick you out of here well before 8 o'clock. Um, 
Someone asked in the chat, and I do want to ask Pascal this, since this was the show that he wanted to do. I'm going to ask Pascal first, and after Pascal answers, I would like... I would like the panel to chime in. But what is the moral of this Eugene Debs tale? What is the legacy, in your opinion, Pascal, of Eugene Debs? I think the legacy of Eugene Debs is a man who was dedicated to improve the condition of the working class, who had a blind spot of issues of race early on in his political career, but developed to become an advocate of Black economic justice in the early 20th century, but still did not go as far as some of his acolytes to his left in fighting for and advocating for Black political and economic and social equality and uh, and uh, end of persecution. And that, uh, you know, he developed politics that evolved on race. He was not, you know, an ideal person, but I think he was a hero of the labor movement. And I think that we should acknowledge the fact that he did move significantly to the left of his own socialist party on the issue of race. And he shouldn't be denied uh, his place for those early missteps, but that he eventually did move on to the point where he was uh, he was heralded by many black socialists that I respect, particularly Hubert, Hubert Harrison. I, I would. Uh, sorry, I would uh, Eric. Here. What's your uh, What's your ender? We're going to go a little well, a little longer than usual because there's no uh, sadly there's no bonus uh, patron half because our our guest did uh, cancel and these guys were doing us a huge solid so we can't take up uh, more of uh, Varn and Kuba's time. But uh, sorry, Varn. What is What is your? Uh, no, I was gonna. I pretty much agree with that assessment, and I think the the only thing that I would say is we can't use socialist heroes to avoid the actual history of the larger movements in in our history so like i think debs is totally laudable um particularly for what he does in the 19 teens um and he was a he was he was highly progressive for socialist on race by the beginning of the 20th century and there's no denying that um but that um that his party kind of wasn't and that has to be dealt with uh and i think without without dealing with that and the the legacy of the spa and its failure um we can't really deal with uh you know the <laughs> the, the why there is no left in america i mean the, the fact that for example there are at least two if not three organizations that can look kind of legitimately claim to be the successor org to the SPA, which died uh, when Max Shackman effectively dissolved it with the help of Michael Harrington um, uh, in, the, in the late 1960s, um, that after that you have the, the SPUSA, uh, the U.S. social, the D DSUS, I forget the acronym, but it's the Social Democrats of America, which become the DSA in the 80s. Um, and there's another group that claims succession to the Social Democrats of America that is not the DSA. I can't remember their name. Um, so that's a to me, that's a sign of failure. Um, and the fact that no left party in the United States has developed an, uh, an identity independent of the Democratic Party since 1936. Mm. is a sign of our of our total failure across the board. I mean, yes, we have little Trotskyists and Stalinist sects or whatever, but they're all like never more than four or 5,000 people. So that's all I have and to say on that. So I, I think that we're very clear on what the left needs to do if it wants to be the left and not just a collection of people who um have a certain ideological propensity and we need to organize i mean the the extent to which eugene debs is useful as an inspiration or as a model or as a figure that can um sort of 
demonstrate how Western um, Western socialists can evolve over time and get to a better place, right? Like, say what you will about Eugene Debs, he never did a no growth. Um, the I think that um, the main thing that we should take away is, you know, like, um, I kept thinking this was Eugene Debs, but um, Joe Hill, his last words before he got executed was, um, don't waste time mourning, organize. And we maybe we need to find new ways of doing it. Um, and we, one thing that's clear is that there's no American left without um, black people, without the mobilization of uh, black Americans um, across the country and uh, cross racial um, alliances that target uh, exploitation by peoples of people of all races. Um, you know, the black leadership class as much as um, the sort of cosmopolitan haute bourgeoisie that that uh, controls the upper levels of capitalism. So, you know, I think that what we need to do is get better at all of the things that we know we need to do. Here, here. whiteboard in the background <laughs> looks like the Oakland PD. I hear they're cracking down on leftists. It's hilarious. <laughs> well, that's not the case. I do want to I, I was throwing this out to Pascal. The people here at the John F. Kennedy Public Library in Vallejo, California have been very, very nice. And I was going to ask if I did a show, if I did the Saturday show here, would you guys well, not you guys on the screen because you guys are in different states and some in undisclosed locations. Would you guys, the listening audience, be down to come through? I know there's a few people in the Bay Area. Come through on a Saturday. I'll get donuts and shit. And uh, we could do the show. Have like a live studio audience that would be able to ask questions to the panel live. I'd run out there with my microphone like Phil Donahue. What say you guys, if you guys think it's a good idea, you have until Friday to let me know. I need people to hit Twitter. This is not for this Saturday, guys. This is for an eventual Saturday. No, we do it this Saturday. Trust me. We have to think about this Saturday. <laughs> Nixon Plummer has spoken. <laughs> So, the John F. Kennedy Public Library in Vallejo, California. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna throw it out there to them, see how they feel about it, because it probably would be a little bit of a change. But I did find out there's a lawyer that comes here the first and third Wednesday of every month to give legal advice for people awaiting trial. The courthouse also across the street. Do a show with him. I do. I want to do because I've been to that just because I was in. So throwing that out there, I need you guys to let me know. Again, hit me up on, on Twitter, Facebook, This Is Revolution, uh, email, booking it, This Is Revolution. If you guys are Patreon patrons, hit me up on Patreon. Let me know what you think about that because I'm hella down to, uh, to do that. I think it would be fun. Um, and, you know. Pascal needs to see me running around with a microphone asking questions to random people. Okay, yeah, that's what Pascal needs. That's what you need. And on that note, I want to send a big, warm thank you to Kuba and Varn for agreeing at such short notice to come on here and talk about Eugene Debs for an hour. I mean, keep in mind... Yeah. We had a better conversation than we went with the guest. <laughs> it means that poor guy that's apparently COVID shitting all over the place. I, 
the amount of work that goes into doing these shows as the men on the screen will tell you when it comes to like researching a topic and making sure you're prepared most guests more guests than you guys think ask us what the questions are going to be beforehand so we really have to you know know the angles we're going to take this threw us a bit of a curveball for these guys to come on so last minute and to just kind of knock it out of the park i appreciate you guys on a level that you probably will never understand i'm trying not to get uh emotional because a lot's been going on but thank you guys very much i appreciate y'all all right brother we love you man absolutely our, our my pleasure every time it's great i always love it thank you and we are out